All right, chapter four of Animal Farm. Last time on Animal Farm, uh, we found out that the pigs are are um, always angry at each other. Uh, that Snowball and Napoleon are seeming to have some sort of a leadership feud. That Snowball is focusing on um, starting up committees and helping um, the animals learn and and grow and govern themselves. And that Napoleon is focused on teaching the young. Um, he's taking these nine puppies up into the loft and is, is educating them. And that both Snowball and Napoleon do agree that the pigs get to drink all the milk and eat all the apples. Um, and that Squealer has been sent out to um, convince the other animals that this is the correct and equal thing to do. Um, you know, we looked at the, the rhetorical sort of analysis of his argument last time. So this time we're going to read chapter four. And uh, remember, it's an allegory. Two levels of meaning. One level is about animals on a farm. Another level, it's about the Russian Revolution. It's also a fable, which means it's got talking animals, but it's going to have a clear moral lesson. Uh, let's see if you figured out what the moral lesson is, uh, what, what is supposed to come out of it at the end. Chapter four. By the late summer, the news of what had happened on Animal Farm had spread across half the country. Sorry, county. Uh, every day, Snowball and Napoleon sent out flights of pigeons whose instructions were to mingle with the animals on neighboring farms and tell them the story of the rebellion and teach them the tune of Beasts of England. So these, you know, um, pigeons represent workers who are trying to spread the communist or animalist, in this case, mission to other farms. You can imagine how that affects other farmers. And, you know, allegorically, um, the rulers of other countries in Europe and across uh, the world didn't much care for the idea of workers overthrowing the ruling class and trying to rule themselves. Uh, that's a threat to their power, especially if you're a king or a queen or somebody like that, uh, not elected by your people. Um, there's danger in this idea of communism. Uh, also, if you own property, there's danger in the idea of communism because in communism, the government owns all the property. Um, you know, so there's the, and by the government owns all the property, technically the people own all the property, but who controls all of that, right? Uh, so there's some interesting things going on here um, when you think about the allegory. How are the other farmers going to feel and why are they going to feel this way? Um, allegorically, you can see what's going on. Most of this time, Mr. Jones had spent sitting in the tap room of the Red Lion at Willingdon, complaining to anyone who would listen of the monstrous injustice he had suffered in being turned out of his property by a pack of good-for-nothing animals. The other farmers sympathized in principle, but they did not at first give him much help. At heart, each of them was secretly wondering whether he could not somehow turn Jones's misfortune to his own advantage. It was lucky that the owners of the two farms which adjoined Animal Farm were on permanently bad terms. One of them, which was named Foxwood, was a large, neglected, old-fashioned farm, much overgrown by woodland, with all its pastures worn out and its hedges in a disgraceful condition. Its owner, Mr. Pilkington, was an easygoing gentleman farmer who spent most of his time fishing or hunting according to the season. The other farm which was called Pinchfield, was smaller and better kept. Its owner was a Mr. Frederick, a tough, shrewd man, perpetually involved in lawsuits and with a name for driving hard bargains. These two disliked each other so much that it was difficult for them to come to any agreement, even in defense of their own interests. So it's interesting here that, that Animal Farms, two neighbors, um, are Mr. Frederick and Mr. Pilkington. And, you know, this whole thing's an allegory, and Animal Farm represents communist Russia, so what do these two farms represent? When you read it carefully and you analyze the language that Orwell chooses, it becomes actually pretty clear which farm is which. So let's get back and, and look at this. Um, let's see. Um, it was lucky that the owners of the two farms that joined Animal Farm were on permanently bad terms. So we're talking about two countries um, that are sort of neighbors or rivals of Russia that hate each other. Um, okay. One of them, which was named Foxwood, Foxwood, okay, uh, was a large, neglected, old-fashioned farm much overgrown by woodland with all of its pastures worn out and its hedges in disgraceful condition. So it's a really big farm, but it's fallen into disrepair. Probably used to be in a much better condition than it is now. Um, its owner, a Mr. Pilkington, was an easygoing gentleman farmer. Uh, who spent most of his time fishing or hunting according to the season. Uh, that's England. Uh, the British Empire was huge. It was all over the world. But by um, the time the Russian Revolution had happened and World War II was about to start, 
Um, England had lost a lot of its power. It, it wasn't the, the center of world power anymore. It didn't have the resources to keep its empire up and running the way it used to. And so things were sort of falling into disrepair and, and not as well kept as they used to be. Foxwood is a good hint. Fox hunting is, a, is an English occupation. Um, and the contrast between England, who's England's primary enemy in the World War II era, uh, I think you, you, those of you who are versed in history already have the answer to this. The other farm, which was called Pinchfield, you ever heard of a pincher? It's a kind of dog from Germany, was smaller and better kept. Its owner was a Mr. Frederick. Frederick the Great is a famous emperor of Germany. A tough, shrewd man perpetually involved in lawsuits. Does that sound like Hitler to anybody? Um, and with a name for driving hard bargains. So you get this sort of idea that, you know, allegorically, um, Pilkington is probably Churchill. And uh, his farm, Foxwood, is England, and Frederick is probably Hitler, and his farm, Pinchfield, is Germany. And so we want to keep that allegory. We want to keep those two levels of meaning clear in our mind. Nevertheless, they both thoroughly were both thoroughly frightened by the rebellion on Animal Farm and very anxious to prevent their own animals from learning too much about it. At first, they pretended to laugh to scorn the idea of animals managing a farm for themselves. The whole thing would be over in a fortnight. That's two weeks. Um, 14 nights, fortnight. They said, they put it about that the animals on the manor farm, they insisted on calling it the manor farm, they would not tolerate the name animal farm, were perpetually fighting among themselves and were, so, were also rapidly starving to death. Um, so this was essentially the reaction of Europe to the communist revolution. They didn't think it would last. They wouldn't talk about Russia as the Soviet Union. They would only talk, talk about it as um, the Russian Empire, which is what it was called before. Uh, so there's that. Um, they're scared of communism, though. Like There, was a, there were anti-communist movements. People were afraid that there were going to be communist revolutions in their own countries, and they were going to lose their land and whatnot. And so uh, England and Germany especially stamped on communist uh, sort of groups and uprisings um, in, in very strong ways. Anyway, um, when time passed and the animals had evidently not starved to death, Frederick and Pilkington changed their tune and began to talk of the terrible wickedness that now flourished on Animal Farm. It was given out that the animals there practiced cannibalism, tortured one another with red-hot horseshoes, and had their females in common. This is what came of rebelling against the laws of nature, Frederick and Pilkington said. So they, they put out there that there's a law of nature, that animals are supposed to be subservient to humans. And, um, you know, try to, try to back that up. Uh, however, these stories were never fully believed. Rumors of a wonderful farm where the human beings have been turned out and the animals manage their own affairs continued to circulate in vague and distorted forms. And throughout that year, a wave of rebelliousness ran through the countryside. Bulls, which had always been tractable, suddenly turned savage. Sheep broke down hedges and devoured the clover. Cows kicked the pail over. Hunters refused their fences and shot their riders onto the other side. Above all, the tune and even the words of beasts of England were known everywhere. It had spread with astonishing speed. The human beings could not contain their rage when they heard this song, though they pretended to think it merely ridiculous. They could not understand, they said, how even animals could bring themselves to to sing such contemptible rubbish. Any animal caught singing it was given a flogging on the spot. And yet, the song was irrepressible. The blackbirds whistled it in the hedges. The pigeons cooed it in the elms. It got into the din of the smithies and the tune of the church bells. And when the human beings listened to it, they secretly trembled, hearing in it a prophecy of their future doom. So this is a statement about the upper class and how they feel about communism and why they're worried about it. Um, early in October, when the corn was cut and stacked and some of it was already threshed, a flight of pigeons came whirling through the air and alighted in the yard of Animal Farm. In the wildest excitement, Jones and all his men, with a half dozen others from Foxwood and Pinchfield, had entered the five-barred gate and were coming up the cart track that led to the farm. They were all carrying sticks, except Jones, who was marching ahead with a gun in his hands. Obviously, they were going to attempt to recapture the farm. Dun, dun, dun. So Jones is coming back, just like, you know, the pigs foretold, and he's going to try and retake his farm. Now, there was an effort to retake communist Russia after it was um, the feet of the Red Army and the White Army fighting each other. Uh, that's what this this is, sort of this um, description. Um, this, this had long been expected, and all preparations had been made. Snowball, 
who had studied an old book of Julius Caesar's campaigns, which he had found in the farmhouse, was in charge of the defensive operations. He gave his orders quickly, and in a couple of minutes, every animal was at his post. As the human beings approached the farm building, Snowball launched his first attack. All the pigeons, to the number of 35, flew to and fro over the men's heads and muted upon them from midair. And while the men were dealing with this, the geese, who had been hiding behind the edge, rushed out and pecked viciously at the calves of their legs. However, this was only a light skirmishing maneuver, intended to create a little disorder, and the men easily drove the geese off with their sticks. Snowball now launched his second line of attack. Muriel, Benjamin, and all the sheep, with Snowball at the head of the attack, rushed forward and prodded and butted the men from every side, while Benjamin turned around and lashed at them with his small hooves. But once again, the men with their sticks and their hobnailed boots were too strong for them, and suddenly, at a squeal from Snowball, which was a signal for retreat, all the animals turned and fled through the gateway into the yard. The men gave a shout of triumph. They saw, as they imagined, their enemies in flight, and they rushed after them in disorder. This was just what Snowball had intended. As soon as they were well inside the yard, the three horses and the three cows and the rest of the pigs who had been lying in ambush in the cowshed suddenly emerged in their rear, cutting them off. Snowball now gave a signal for the charge. He himself dashed straight for Jones. Jones saw him coming, raised his gun, and fired. The pellets scored bloody streaks along Snowball's back, and a sheep dropped dead. Without halting for an instant, Snowball flung his 15 stone. That's a measurement of weight. I think a stone is like 20 pounds. Um, so 15 stone is, you know, a lot, 300 pounds. I don't know. We'd have to look it up. Maybe a stone is 12 pounds. Somebody, somebody look it up and write it in the comments. Um, against Jones's leg, Jones was hurled into a pile of dung and his gun flew out of his hands. But the most terrifying spectacle of all was Boxer rearing up on his hind legs and striking out with his great iron shod hooves like a stallion. His very first blow took a stable lad from Foxwood on the skull and stretched him lifeless in the mud. At the sight, several men dropped their sticks and tried to run. Panic overtook them, and the next moment, all the animals together were chasing them round and round the yard. They were gored, kicked, bitten, trampled on. There was not an animal on the farm that did not take vengeance on them after his own fashion. Even the cat suddenly leapt from a roof onto a cowman's shoulders and sank her claws into his neck, at which he yelled horribly. At the moment when an opening was clear, the men were glad enough to rush out of the yard and make a bolt for the main road. And so within five minutes of their invasion, they were in ignominious retreat by the same way as they had come with a flock of geese hissing after them and pecking at their calves all the way. All the men were gone except one. Back in the yard, Boxer was pawing with his hoof at the stable lad who lay face down in the mud, trying to turn him over. The boy did not stir. He is dead, said Boxer sorrowfully. Oh, I had no intention of doing that. I forgot that I was wearing iron shoes. Who will believe that I did not do this on purpose? No sentimentality, comrade, cried Snowball, from whose wounds the blood was still dripping. War is war. The only good human being is a dead one. Oh, I have no wish to take a life, nor even human life, repeated Boxer, and his eyes were full of tears. All right, so we have an intentional juxtaposition here. Boxer, despite his size, um, you know, and his lack of intelligence or whatever, he's very compassionate. He he killed this guy. Um and he feels really bad about it. Snowball, the pig, in contrast, is like, the only good human's a dead human, right? And so he's got this very different attitude towards life than Boxer does. Um, anyway, that contrast, I think, is is telling about the characters themselves. Uh, where's Molly? exclaimed somebody. Molly, in fact, was missing. For a moment, there was a great alarm. It was feared that the men might have harmed her in some way or even carried her off with them. In the end, however, she was found hiding in her stall with her head buried among the hay in the manger. She had taken the flight as soon as the gun went off. And when the others came back from looking for her, it was to find that the stable lad, who in fact was only stunned, had already recovered and made off. Pause. So Molly, remember, represents the upper class. She didn't want to have any part in this war. She was maybe even hoping that Jones would take back over. And so she went and hid and waited for it to all be over. Um, and then the stable lad had recovered and run off. It seems unlikely to me, given the description of his wounds. Uh, but when they all went off to look for Molly, you know, is it possible the pigs moved the body? I don't know. I mean, 
it's it's never clear, but I think we're already getting to the point where we can't really trust what the pigs tell you. Um, you know, we can't we can't trust what what is going on. And the story sort of told from the animal's perspective, so we always hear what the animals think, not sort of an omniscient narrator who who knows what really happens. A lot of times we have to put that together for ourselves. Um, anyway. The animals had now reassembled in the wildest excitement, each recounting his own exploits in the battle at the top of his voice. An impromptu celebration of the victory was held immediately. The flag was run up and Beasts of England was sung a number of times. Then the sheep who had been killed was given a solemn funeral, a hawthorn bush being planted on their grave. At the graveside, Snowball made a little speech emphasizing the need for all animals to be ready to die for Animal Farm if need be. The animals decided unanimously to create a military decoration, Animal Hero First Class, which was conferred there and then on Snowball and Boxer. It consisted of a brass medal, they were really some old horse brasses which had been found in the harness room, to be worn on Sundays and holidays. There was also Animal Hero Second Class, which was conferred posthumously on the dead sheep. Pause. Is, is wearing a ribbon or a, a medal? Wearing clothes? Is it a breaking of the commandments? There was much discussion as to what the battle should be called. In the end, it was named the Battle of the Cowshed, since that was where the ambush had been sprung. Mr. Jones's gun had been found lying in the mud, and it was known that there was a supply of cartridges in the farmhouse. It was decided to set the gun up at the foot of the flagstaff like a piece of artillery and to fire it twice a year. On October the 12th, the anniversary of the Battle of the Cowshed, and once on Midsummer Day, the anniversary of the Rebellion. All right, that's the end of Chapter 4, a nice short chapter for you. Um, but, you know, they've solidified their rebellion. They've sort of made their claim to the land official by kicking Jones out with his allies. And, uh, you know, you see Snowball being a hero and Boxer being a hero in that fight. So. Uh, we also characterize Snowball and Boxer a little bit more.